It's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Noah Kuff, who is a uh, nationally famous and recognized uh, clinical geneticist. And um, he's listed here as a Duke, but he has some other information for you, which uh, I, I will not take away his opportunity to share. And, uh, and then we're going we're gonna to go from there. So I'm going to let Dr. Cuff run this session. Sir? Um, well, first of all, I want to thank Tom and Cindy uh, for the opportunity to moderate this session. Uh, as uh, Tom mentioned, uh, I am currently Director of Clinical Cancer Genetics at uh, Duke Cancer Institute. But actually, um, as of July, I will actually be Director of Cancer Genetics in the Northwell Health System. Um, <laughs> um, in terms of introductions, um, a couple of quick housekeeping things. We have 15 world-renowned speakers um, for the, the, uh, the, the remainder of the afternoon. And all of them have been given a grand total of 10 minutes. Um, I have actually got the unenviable job, and it's partly because I am the most junior person at Northwell, is how I got this job, of keeping all of the speakers to on time. I was going to get the Wizard of Oz hourglass um, and to try and do it, but what I've actually been told, though, is if we stay in this room past 6 o'clock, it's kind of like being late to daycare, where they charge us by the minute. And we actually think it's going to be more important to keep the funds available for programs uh, of the organization rather than um, listening to us. So I will, I apologize in advance that I'm going to be brutal to the speakers, all of whom I would happily listen to any of them for hours. But... Without further ado, um, the f we're going to first have a presentation uh, from Susan Wisnow sorry, Susan Wisowski, I'm, I'm mispronouncing your name, Wisowski, um, who is a colorectal cancer advocate with a personal, uh, very personal experience uh, about early onset colorectal cancer, and I'd like you to give your attention to her. Just want to make sure I got that straight. It's Wysocki, just like ice hockey. <laughs> so he mispronounced it like three different times. That's okay. I get. I was always last for dodgeball. So um, I'm Susan Wysocki. You may remember me from last year when Stacy Hurt um, told my daughter Jessica's story. Um, last year when I was here, Jessica ended up in the ICU. She died about a month later, um, and she passed away the day after what should have been her high school graduation. Um, she was going to be a surgeon um, because she wanted to save lives, and I miss her every second of every minute of every day. But as I told Cindy, I'm not here to be a boohoo mom. Uh, since the second she was diagnosed, I jumped into finding answers head first. Um, and I have no doubt that everyone in this room is divided, is devoted to finding those answers too. But if this were your child, um, Somehow I think that level of devotion might take on a whole new meaning. So I say I'm an evidence-based mom. In fact, I asked him you put that on the program, but <laughs> um, because on my bedside table next to a lot of books about heaven are articles with titles like Reviews in Basic and Clinical Gastroenterology and Hepatology, Inflammation in the Intestinal Barrier, Leukocyte Epithelial Cell Interaction, Cell Junction Remodeling and Mucosal Repair. I'm not a medical doctor, but I am a mom doctor. And I hope some of the research I share will be helpful. So how did this happen? Looking at some of the environmental and epigenetic factors from an evidence-based mom. OK. So in Jessica's case, we had two and a half years of looking at this. In her case, it was 17 months from diagnosis to her death. So this is Jessica, perfectly happy and healthy. And this was Jessica when she passed, uh, not quite a year ago. So how did we get there in 17 months? What was going on? Um, she didn't fit any of the profile. Uh, she played club sports, five different club sports, tennis, swimming, everything else. 
uh, not overweight, none of the factors, no family history. Unfortunately, she's not the only one. Uh, Mia on the left passed away uh, in October. She was 13. Alex um, passed away when he was 17, I believe. And um, Marie is currently fighting for her life at Sloan Kettering this week. She had HIPEC last week. So, and she had the same tumor histology as Jessica, which was microsatellite stable, poorly, di uh, poorly differentiated, and she had signet ring cell, for whatever that's worth. So looking at some of the early exposures, have to go back to mom, me. Um, the Environmental Working Group did a cord study where they looked at the umbilical cord blood of newborn babies and shockingly found that 287 chemicals were in that cord blood, industrial chemicals, things like lead, mercury, PCBs, they found 180 chemicals linked to cancer. They found 217 chemicals linked to brain and nervous system. And when they did the study again in 2009, they found 21 new toxins, including BPA. So they even found things linked to burning gasoline and uh, garbage. So that's pretty shocking. So I don't know if anybody's ever seen this ad. I was in advertising for 20 years. DDT is good for me. We probably thought that was long gone because it was banned in 1972. Unfortunately, almost 50 years later, it's still very persistent. Uh, it's, in fact, almost in 100% of us. The CDC found 99% of people tested had it in their blood. So guess what? Your veggies still have them in it, too. 42% of kale, 24% of carrots. All of the food you think you're eating that you believe is healthy may not actually be so healthy. So even things like sardines and salmon that we would consider healthy. But the important takeaway from this is that these chemicals are man-made, they're toxic, and they bioaccumulate and bioperssist. Bio so I looked at what else was going on in my daughter's life around this time in 1997. Uh, she was born in 99, but this is relevant. And we were dealing with the age of antibacterial. All of a sudden, Antibacterial was everywhere. We had it in the diaper bag, we had it in the car, we had it everywhere. But guess what? The problem is we are bacteria. 90% of our cells are microbial, and the other 10% are human. So what do, we, what do we think we're doing when we're killing off all of these germs? <laughs> That's something that I think we need to think about. So the antibacterial movement is really contrary to the hygiene hypothesis. One of the things that our doctors told us was that you know, we used to eat, we used to make mud pies and eat them. We don't do that anymore. <laughs> um, but we know that early exposure to germs helps a child's immune system develop. We know that there's a complex interaction between the gene environment and the, b between genes and our environment, and that we see increases in allergic diseases and inflammatory disorders. So there's this fine balancing of T helper cells one and two and T cell responses triggered by altered or missing immune cell, innate immune cell activation. So these are pattern recognition receptors that play a critical role in early shaping of immune system and development of our immune system. And that's why pig pen is up there, because that might not be such a bad thing to strive for. So one of the things that was an important chemical in the whole antibacterial movement was something called triclosan. In 2010, the uh, NRDC sued the FDA for not finalizing a 1978 ban on triclosan. So that took a really long time, right? 40 some odd years? In 2016, the FDA finally bans triclosan in hand sanitizer and soap. But guess what? It's still in thousands of personal care products today. So if you look on Colgate's website, you'll see that total toothpaste with triclosan is something that is a patented formula. So how can triclosan be banned in soap, but okay in toothpaste? That's a head scratcher, right? Well, apparently Colgate couldn't answer this question either, because about a month ago, in February, they had a huge launch to correlate with the Super Bowl to launch a whole new formula, guess what, with no triclosan. But how long did that take? From 1978, to 2019. So, and by the way, what's Gantrez? 
On the Colgate website, there's something that says, the Colgate formula is so revolutionary, it's even patented. Its active ingredient is triclosan, which is used to help reduce plaque and gum problems. The Gantrez cold polymer enables triclosan to continue working in the mouth for 12 hours. But when you look at Gantrez, we find out that it's genotoxic, and when it was evaluated for its polyanhydride nanoparticles, it's in the gastrointestinal tract of mice. It's shown to be highly mucus permeable carrier, and it's able to reach the gastrointestinal epithelium. So it's significant <laughs> in that it in in induced DNA strand breaks and oxidized bases in the duodenum or duodenum. I never know how to say that. But they're, they're basically discussing it as a promising nanocarrier as for oral delivery drug systems. This is basically a missile that carried triclosan into the epithelial lining. So that's something that I think people should think about. So a closer look at triclosan. A University of Massachusetts study uh, that was published in Science and Translation Medicine six days after Jessica passed away, showed that when you spiked water with uh, triclosan over a period of three weeks at human levels, there were 100% gut problems, uh, colon inflammation, rectal bleeding, abdominal pain, and reduced lifespan. So it devastated the microbiome diversity, it killed off the bifidobacterium, it transformed the intestinal flora into an antagonist, which increased inflammatory response, and it encouraged more aggressive tumor development in those lab animals that already had existing colon cancer. That's another thing that I think is particularly significant. So here we are, over four, days, four decades after it was known to be unsafe, still persistent. There's no enforcement for any companies to take this out of their products. Uh, and we see that it's in 75% of us as well, just like DDT. It's among the top 10 biggest polluters of U.S. rivers, uh, and they saw that mice bred without, this gut, without gut bacteria experienced no inflammation even after exposure to triclosan, which underscores that it's gut specific, and it doesn't just kill off the good guys. This is a Harvard chart that shows the increased risk of drug-resistant bacteria Bacteria in your skin becomes resistant to the triclosan itself, which is triclosan-resistant uh, bacteria, which then creates specific protein mutations that exacerbate anti antibacterial resistance even further. So their mutant bacteria produce offspring that are immune to many more antibiotics. There's a pattern here. So if you look at antibiotics themselves, you see, yes, we know they're being overused. Um, but mostly they're being the highest incidence of their uses in children under two uh, and, and people over 65. But there are probably over 50 million prescriptions a year that are unnecessary. So we know that one course of antibiotics can knock out a third of your gut microbiome, and that can take months or years to grow back. And in some cases, the species never return. What else was going on? The age of whiter and brighter. Also launched in 1998 and 1999 were this whole plethora of whitening products. Everything from uh, Eclipse gum to Optic White, everything had to be super white. Well, there's a problem with that. Those products contain something called titanium dioxide, which is in virtually everything. It's in so many consumer products I can't even begin to tell you but it's, most, it's one of the most widely pigments in, used pigments in the world. It's used in paper, paints, plastics, coatings, pharmaceuticals, sunscreen, cosmetics, toothpaste, and food. Some of these things should not be in the same sentence together. And by the way, I would not be grabbing those handfuls of M&Ms off the table because they are bleached with titanium dioxide before they're color-coded. So what do we know about titanium dioxide? Well, we know that it leads to 40% increase in precancerous growth in tumors, uh, specifically on the colon, in studies. Uh, in France, the, Institute, the National Institute for Agricultural Research did a study for 90 days on E171 and T102 and found just food-grade titanium dioxide, 40% of rats developed precancerous lesions on, col on their colons. That is really startling. So, and we know that kids are getting a much higher level of this than everyone else. So it's because it's widely used in confectionery. But I imagine that's what a rat would look like 
after having 40% increase in colon lesions. So we know that it, it ends up having transcription uh, issues in molecular alterations in the, in the a colon of a, of a mouse in these studies. It affects the microflora and the absorption of calcium, phosphorus, and magnesium. And food grade T102 um, impairs intestinal and systematic immune homeostasis and promotes lesions on the colon. So there's thousands and thousands of studies about this. So kudos to France. They immediately said, we are getting this out of all of our food immediately. They did an immediate ban on all of their food that contained titanium dioxide. And so far here, we've done, we haven't done any of that. What we know about titanium dioxide on the skin is that it's not photostable. It's in everything, and it is absorbed. So one important thing to remember is that as a photocatalyst, it can be used to decompose environmental pollutants. Again, this is something we're putting in our skin and ingesting. This is important because there's a story about the fact that these roofs in Australia were getting all kinds of warranty claims because the manufacturer was trying to figure out why there was damage to these roofs. They found out that there, were only damage to the, there was only damage to the edges of these roofs, and it was because it was from the sunscreen on the fingertips of the installers that voided the warranties on these roofs. So that's something to think about. The EU is deciding as we speak whether or not to classify this as a class 2B carcinogen. Uh, as class 2, it's currently a class 2B. So at the moment, they're saying that they're not going to change that, uh, and it's following over a million dollars in lobbying from the industry. So about a month ago, the FDA came out and said, guess what? 14 out of 16 chemicals in sunscreen are unsafe. Zinc oxide and titanium dioxide supposedly are. Well, we've been using this on our kids for decades. So anyway, I think I need to wrap up. Um, <laughs> but, because I'm getting the look. But um, anyway, so but the, the, the basic bottom line is that zinc oxide is no safer than titanium dioxide. So that's something that we see in all of these studies. And I should probably end it there, I guess. I have a lot more to cover, but maybe if you want to ask me other questions, I'd be happy to go over any of the research that I've done. So.